Hey there, everyone. It is Christy. Hello, and welcome to an episode of Feminist Talk Back, where I have on uh, feminists and also sometimes egalitarians and other people. Well, mostly egalitarians and feminists. I've never had someone who identifies as not as anti-feminist on the show yet, uh, or non-feminists. But we'll have to see. Anyway. I have real people here I can actually introduce you to, not just talk about hypothetical ones. And that is uh, my guest who's joining me for the second time, Jody. Say hi to the people, Jody. Hello, I'm back. <laughs> yeah. Well, before we get started on the topics, do you want to tell people what the most recent video that you've done is? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, I posted a video a couple of weeks ago um, about how words can really affect you, like long term even just like the bullying in like primary school secondary school like it can affect you throughout your whole life and yeah it's actually uh proud of yeah. doing so far so great, well, great video I'm, go check that out by the way <laughs> <laughs> i will put a link to the description to that in the description box below so everyone can go check that out and <laughs> Yes, and then first time um, participant, but I feel like a long time friend. Rez, from your channel, do you want to talk a little bit about your most recent video too? And also say hi to the people. Oh, hello, everybody. <laughs> um, oh, gosh, what was, I think my most recent video was the atheist video, possibly. I do more political type stuff on my channel, but I do also like to talk about social issue kind of things. And I, I think maybe the most recent one was where I talked about my journey to atheism. Great. So that link will also be in the description, guys. Uh, go and click on that. Check it out. If I remember, I'll also put it in the little I corner card links as well. So on this episode of Feminist Talk Back, we're going to try to be a bit topical, but tie it into larger themes. And by that, I mean, we're going to take up the larger theme of the uh, um, feminism's not needed in the West, that idea that gets thrown around in the comment section and in video titles quite often, and juxtaposition that against the events this week at Fox News. Now, as many of you probably know, Bill O'Reilly, who is the star of The O'Reilly Factor, the biggest news show on cable television, the most profitable show at Fox News, uh, the guy who is in, you know, leads that show, Bill O'Reilly, has been accused of sexual harassment, um, I think for at least a couple decades now, and Fox News has paid out five women up to around $13 million, and also they had to assign sign agreement saying that they wouldn't talk about it or pursue any further legal action. So Bill O'Reilly's, this is a pattern of behavior. Um, the New York Times recently did an article exposing this long-term trend and the money that the corporation is paid to kind of hush up his transgressions, his accused transgressions. And another woman came out in the news saying that she was also had experienced a retaliation because she didn't go with him to his hotel room when they he invited her to dinner to talk about her career. So, um, um, rather surprisingly, uh, there's a kind of a long intro, but then I'm going to get to my guests. So, <laughs> thank you for being patient, guys. So the interesting dynamic, of course, is that Fox News knew about this for a long time. But after the New York Times story came out, there were advertisers who started to pull out of the show and a social media campaign. And he's been the target of social media campaigns in the past because of the kind of behavior and other things that he's done. The social media campaign started targeting advertisers and the show started to shed profit, basically profits quite quickly to the point where one night his show actually ended like 12 minutes early because they didn't have any ads to run in the oh break Oh my time. gosh, you're kidding me. I didn't know that. No. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. So Bill, yeah. Bill took a, um, a, a vacation that he claimed <laughs> he was planned. Yeah, yeah. This is, it was amazing. Like Everyone's like, what the happened? The show is gone. So, like, so um, he went on vacation and struggles. There's a lot of things that people think went into the decision, but ultimately Bill O'Reilly was let go from Fox. Now that might've been because Rupert Murdoch, who has traditionally protected him and is more interested in profits um, than moral character, was um, finally persuaded by his younger sons who are trying to rebrand and reform the corporation. They were the same people who were on the side of getting rid of Roger Ailes last year as well. The sons wanted to get rid of O'Reilly. Their dad eventually gave in. There's also the issue that the sponsors had left. So this was having serious financial consequences for Fox News. And interestingly, they, the Rupert Murdoch is trying to buy Sky Television again in the UK. And as part of that 
process of owning a public company, they have to go through their books. The government goes through their books to make sure they're engaging in proper corporate practices. One of the problems that has been a knock-on effect of the New York Times expose is that they've now linked the fact that the 13 million that was paid out to women who had filed harassment claims against O'Reilly was not reported as payouts for settlements. They reported as like income and other things. So they were engaging in deceptive reporting practices. Now, the last time Murdoch tried to buy Sky was right before the, the phone hacking scandal that, um, the, that happened that blew up in the British tabloids where his tabloid newspapers, um, people were going into celebrity um, voicemails and just punching in as many numbers as they could to get into their voicemails and then listening uh, to see what was going on in these people's private lives. So that prevented him from getting the Sky deal last time. And now, of course, Bill O'Reilly threatened it again. So I think it was ended up being um, a lot about corporate profits more than moral uh, responsibility. But that's not what I want to focus on tonight, because we're not here to discuss economics. We're here to discuss uh, topics related to feminism or issues that affect women um, or feminist things that uh, feminists bring up, you know, things that um, feminists pay attention to, whether or not they affect men or women or trans people. So what I would like to do is talk about the way that power worked at Fox and its corporate culture. Because what you have in Murdoch, Ailes, and O'Reilly are a bunch of men who were raised and socialized in a time where women had a place. And that place was to serve men and to be eye candy. And it seems like those guys never quite left that mentality. Because you've got Murdoch, who doesn't care, Ailes actually you know, being a predator within the workplace, and Bill O'Reilly harassing women, again, kind of being a predator in the workplace. So, Jody, now that you're back... Yes, that sorry, it that was a bit, I, bit of a technical fall from that. But we managed to flow well. Um, I want to I want to introduce the concept to some of the people in America who might not be familiar with it. Um, can you t say what a when you when the British talk about someone being a sex pest, what does that mean? Um, basically, someone who routinely uh, makes lewd comments or inappropriate actions. And just basically a bit of a perv. Um, <laughs> so I think I think you know what Bill O'Reilly's, and we can say it's his alleged behavior. But honestly, there is a recording, a transcription, and a recording of him uh, being a sex pest. So I think we're not going to defame him in any meaningful way by calling him a sex pest. The question that I want to bring up is, you know, if feminism is no longer needed in the West, I, then how can people who claim that explain the kind of power dynamic and the problems? that were happening at Fox News. Um, so I don't know, uh, Jody, you kind of dropped out a little bit early, so maybe you want to listen to Rez. Um, yeah. And yeah, do you want to talk a little bit about um, corporate culture? And I know that, you know, you've got, um, you know, um, like some professional connections. So you might want to, um, if you want to talk a little bit about uh, things like your corporate practices, like in our corporation, that would not be tolerated ever where I work. Are you talking about me? Yep, yep. Um, well, I mean, I think that it, it does, it's a corporation by corporation thing. It's hard to say that it, there's a blanket statement across the board, but I've worked in law firms for, well, almost my whole adult life. <laughs> and, um, and there is absolutely a, um, there seem, especially in the law field, it seems like there is a there is a sort of culture of women just not being, even women lawyers, just not being considered quite as smart as men. But I have never personally come across any like sexual harassment kind of thing, so I can't speak to that specifically. Um, but I definitely would agree that you know that that within that in this particular situation, they were probably all pretty gross individuals and don't actually care about what happened to the women. Um, they care about their pocketbooks, but. Yeah, definitely. And that was, it, it creates a culture where people, well, Bill O'Reilly knew he could get away with it, or at least he thought he could. All right. You got um, a sense of male entitlement to talk to women, women yeah. that you find attractive, right? It's nothing to do on their side. Suddenly you decide you find a woman attractive and you're going to go up and say lewd things to her. Um, and his expectation that there would be no consequences. And there for a long time, there weren't. Yeah, no, I definitely think he thought he was going to get away with it. There's there's no doubt in my mind about that. 
-hmm. I think he is probably just absolutely shocked that this happened and probably can't understand. I think a lot of men who do that kind of thing, like, okay, if you're, if you find a woman attractive and you want to let that woman know that you find her attractive, I feel like there are ways to do that, that are okay, that are permissible, that are, you know, uh, respectable. Right. But I think a lot of men look at it. And I think Bill O'Reilly is one of those guys that looks at it. Like, um, it's a, no matter how I approach it, no matter how I come across to you, it's a compliment and you should consider it a compliment, no matter whether I'm respectful in my advances, whether I'm appropriate in my advances, you just should consider it a compliment. So I think that he's probably like mind blown, like, Hey man, I was just complimenting. You know what I mean? I watched Bill Maher from his Friday show and his take I had to disagree with. I disagree with Bill, Bill Maher a lot. And he was actually beating up on Bill O'Reilly, but he said, Bill is so desperate for women to like him. And that's why he does this. Like, I don't think it has anything to do mm -hmm. with desperation. Jody, it sounds mm -hmm. like power more to me than. Yeah, maybe. definitely. Because if you're in like such a high position, you think you can get anything that you want, uh, whether it be a raise or dinner or that good looking woman like you think that you deserve it because you're so high and mighty um at least that's what probably the case that he just thought oh well she's nice i want her so therefore i will have her kind of like that when you're a celebrity they'll let you do anything mm -hmm. you want thing and exactly. this is the other time is of course the president defended him this guy is an admitted sexual assault. I know that blew my mind. What an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, uh, and it just, it's like the old pervy man's club. I mean, I can just kind of see, see him, <laughs> Ailes and O'Reilly and Trump, Bill Cosby sitting yeah. around just being all uh -huh. pervy together. And don't you want me because, you know, I have a famous penis. Like, what? No. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so rich and so famous. Everyone everyone wants me, so therefore you should want me, so I will have you. Yeah, exactly. There must be something wrong with you if you don't want me. Exactly. <laughs> I kind of think that's probably how he, yeah, I think that's closer to what he thought. You know, like, I can get you a job, I can get you on my show, I can get you on the biggest cable show in America. Yep. As long as you do something for me first. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> And if you don't, I'm going to call your purse ugly. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, in, and insult the price of your soda water. <laughs> what? There's also it's, the... It's ridiculous. Yeah. There's also the sort of dehumanization. You know, women at, at Fox, if you've ever... There's been, you know, people who've commented on this and done some videos as well. But if you look at how they have to dress, you know, they're, they're made to wear skirts. They're not allowed to wear trousers. The skirts have to be above the knee. You know, they have to be young and fit and attractive or an Wait, older where is woman. This that you're talking about? Fox News, the <gasps> TV. Yeah. They you have know, like an actual dress code? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And trousers on women are not allowed. You know, and so... Is that why they hated me? Hillary so much? <laughs> <laughs> Pantsuits. They just, they're like kryptonite. <laughs> There was a woman who was a guest on Bill O'Reilly several times, and she said her, she had a problem with him because he called her by the wrong name. He said, oh, I'm sorry, there's so many blondes around here. I get them mixed up. And he said, you know, there's Megan. And he starts listing all these kinds of blondes. And then at the end of the show, he said, um, thank you very much for your blondness. And she went to Roger <sighs> Ailes to complain about basically being, oh, you're not here for your brains or your opinion. You're just a good looking blonde you know that i and you know and roger ale said uh nobody likes bill it's a problem but he makes us a lot of money yeah well i mean he didn't even need to say that to say it right yeah he didn't even need to use the words to portray that that or to relay that that's where his mind is yeah and we've seen an exodus gretchen carlson or gretchen is that her name yeah um megan kelly and um there's another woman who's recently left i can't remember now oh um uh greta sestern she also left. So you see this exodus of women from Fox. You see that the way that they're sort of presented as, you know, um, things to be objectified. And I actually off air, I was mentioning the incident that happened not in the most recent election, but in the election before that. So that would have been 2012. There was the issue. Was it? No, maybe it was 2008. It was when Karl Rove had his meltdown about uh, Iowa. 
and whether or not no Ohio was going to flip or not. And there was this question because it was, it was coming down to Ohio and Karl Rove was insisting that they shouldn't call the election yet, even though all the other news networks had called the election for Obama. Uh, and Roger Ailes directed them from the booth to say, OK, send Megan downstairs to talk to the guys who are doing the projections because we should really see her legs on camera. <sighs> and so the the shot if you go back and look at it the cameraman has got it in such a way that you get the full length of her it's not just her like from the waist up you get her legs in the shot as well but wait i thought they were a serious news organization mm -hmm. oh definitely i'm so confused apparently They're getting serious a stiffy, as long as you have legs yeah yeah getting a stiffy <laughs> on, the, on the election night is what serious journalism is all about <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny so, oh my uh, God. <laughs> so the you know the question becomes if you have these power structures i mean in this case it happened from the outside corporate change at fox did not happen from within so if we don't need feminism how do these how do women or men who are victims of sexual assault in a pl place where they can't speak up get justice exactly mm -hmm. there's exactly. not many places to go yeah, you can't go to human resources, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the other thing, if women do come forward, and it's just, I'm not saying men don't have to experience sexual harassment, that's not what I'm talking about. When I talk about sometimes feminist issues, sometimes what I'm referring to is issues that affect women disproportionately, but also affect men, but to a lesser uh, number, right? So yeah. sexual harassment in the workplace disproportionately affects women. That's why I think it's a feminist issue. I also think because of intersectionality, we should include men's experiences. That way, feminism is for everybody. Yay. It is for everybody. <laughs> it is. Oh, I guess we should say not everyone in the room is a feminist. Just to go on the record. Right. Yes. Yeah, um, well, I, okay, so I, but I think I, I, uh, it's a very confusing issue for me because uh, if you look at the straight definition of it, just wanting equal rights for men and women, I am a feminist, but I'm also a men's right activist because I believe they need support and things. And I'm also an anti-racist. So I always considered those words to be interchangeable. I can say I'm an egalitarian and I can say I'm a feminist and I can say I'm a, um, but I'm finding more and more now that um, you are just absolutely shut down the moment you use that F word. And it worries me because my spectrum is more in the political spectrum. Um, and I do, like I said, I, I work on social issues as well, and I talk about social issues as well. But um, I, I, I worry using that word will it, it just shuts people down immediately. And mm -hmm. so, because to me, in my mind, they are interchangeable. Because by virtue of being an egalitarian, I am a feminist, and I am a men's rights activist, and I am an anti-racist. Um, it seems like it might be more sensical for me on in my political spectrum to just go with egalitarian. Just to That's avoid that enough. whole shutting people down, because uh, it it really does. I mean, it just immediately puts you in this category. Uh, they discredit you the second they hear that word, and I don't feel like that's fair. Because again, I think the words are interchangeable, but I'm seeing that other people do not look at it like that. Hmm. Jody, you identify as a feminist. Since we're on the topic, we can come back to sexual harassment oh, yeah, and I, afterwards. But uh, um, so that's, an, I mean, I completely understand and I relate and I agree. Yeah. If you identify as an egalitarian, I think inherently you are a feminist and anti racist and, and um, you know, for mm -hmm. gay equality and trans rights. So uh, trans equality, not just rights. Um, but yeah, Jody, you, let's, let's go with this topic. You want to talk a little bit about why you identify the way you do? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Um, well, like a few years ago, like, I don't know, 16, 17, maybe 18-year-old Jody, if you didn't identify as a feminist, then, oh, you're a bad person, like, uh, what I'm for. But as I've grown older, I'm like, actually, that's so narrow-minded, like, what the hell? Um, but I think feminism, it, it fits me because of the struggle that the word has gone through, because, like, yeah it is for everyone and myself an intersectional feminist because like yeah i i see all like the different things words are escaping me right now but hang in there um <laughs> but you know i just think that first and foremost we need to 
like not focus on women so much but like how to explain it without sounding like oh I hate men but I don't hate men because I still want to like help men but like first and foremost there are things that women need to have help with more if that makes any sense yes. I mean that's why you call it like a, I would call it a feminist issue and that women are disproportionately affected by it and, yeah, and exactly. nobody says we always have to work on everybody's issues equally if we all did that we wouldn't have time we all specialize exactly yeah the specialization thing I, I totally understand I can see both I can see both yeah. issues of it I, or both sides of it absolutely but mm. for me I just feel like um, if, if, if a word is going to immediately shut down the conversation I would prefer not to use the word yeah, yeah because exactly I'm all about enough. conversation and I'm all about cross aisle conversation and whatnot and I'm not saying that you guys aren't obviously you no, guys no, are no. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I and I totally get that but I just think for me personally it shuts the conversation down and I'm entirely I'm way more interested in the issues and the conversation than the word hmm yeah and your yeah, channel exactly. you started your channel as a way to start that conversation yeah Right, so that's perfectly within the remit of your mission statement, right? You don't want to use exclusive language, you know, right. the language that would be excluding. Whereas I kind of got on YouTube to like go, hey, um, I have, I know about these things, <laughs> and and you, mm -hmm. and these things aren't being covered on YouTube, so I'm gonna talk about them a lot of the yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, I just, I, it, it, it makes me very sad that they aren't. I, to me, it is so clearly obvious that they are interchangeable. And when you're talking about women's issues, you talk about feminism, and when you're talking about you know, trans rights, then or you, then you talk about it, then you're talking about that. I mean, like, and then but but then as an umbrella over all of it, it's an egalitarian. So I just don't understand why the words are not interchangeable. <laughs> <laughs> well, because some words have become toxic, right? But I mean, the reason why I identify as a feminist, I guess it's because, you know, I was identifying as a feminist back around probably when I was you know 13 or 14. So it wasn't like YouTube was going to change my mind on this. Um, because my feminism really sprung from my reaction to the way that the Catholic Church's teachings that I was taught growing up really didn't sit very well with me. I felt women were treated very unfairly, especially growing yeah. up in a sort of, you know, post Roe v. Wade, post second wave feminism America, yes. where, you know, it's all about your opportunities and, you know, making it and rising. So um, that was the start of it for me. And it was very much grounded in basic things like reproductive, um, contraceptive access and reproductive control, thing you know and it also um the church's stance on homosexuality i mean the catholic church isn't as bad i mean they're actually pretty light on you know on that but it was mm -hmm. still a thing i had a problem with so when i kind of came to youtube and i would say i'm a feminist and people would go what do you think of anedia sarkeesian i'm like who <laughs> <laughs> and and people were like well she's a feminist and if you um are a feminist you should know about her i'm like i was a feminist before she was born okay <laughs> So I don't really need to defer to her opinions, you know, like any to defer to me. <laughs> yeah. Like she's got her opinions. I don't, you know, that's not my thing. Um, but yeah, there's mm -hmm. the term itself because of a, a certain narrative. But this, you know, within the YouTube community, let's limit it to this. Um, there's been a certain narrative built up about feminists and associations yeah. put on to feminists. So people come with that baggage to the word. But to be fair, as long as there have been women speaking up for equality and um, to have their voices heard, there has been there have been anti-feminists. There were anti-feminists in the suffrage movement calling women who wanted to vote manly and um, mm -hmm. you know, oh, like they wouldn't they wouldn't be good mothers or they didn't want to have children because of their perverse nature or they were lesbians. You know, um, so women's characters have been attacked from the start. You know, the only mm -hmm. difference now, in my view, looking back at it, because again, with the 1980s, you had the second kind of uh, well, second wave feminism. You had really horrible pushback. That's why like feminazi. That's when the term sort of got, came into use. So it's just digital now, and it's more like instead of big voices, you've got thousands of smaller voices, but there are in some ways more vicious because they don't have to be held as responsible as people who actually are in the media. Yeah. Well, and it's been turned into um, an entertainment source. It's yeah, not even exactly. a matter of principle for most of these people. It's a matter of how can I get the views? How can I impress people? How can I be funny? How can you know what I mean? It doesn't even feel like it's a principles issue with them at all, for the most mm -hmm. part. I think if it was, then uh, then they would be you know more factual in their responses um, and less, less emotional. Uh, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. 
but clearly it's just for, for, for on the digital part anyway, I think it's absolutely a, a views and entertainment thing now as opposed to seriously caring about the issues. Yeah, like the amount of times that the traditional anti-feminist YouTubers go after the way someone talks or the way they look or the mm -hmm. colour of their hair or whatever, it's just like if you were actually like interested in them, you would attack what they were saying, their, their ideas, rather mm -hmm. than if they've eaten too many pizzas. Like, mm -hmm. totally agree. Oh, it's ridiculous. Yeah, totally basically, agree. by focusing on a woman's looks or the way her voice sounds um, or whether or not you'd want to sleep with her, you're proving why we need feminism. Because <laughs> exactly. you're not addressing your points. <laughs> well, to be fair, they do it to dudes, too. <laughs> yeah. You know, when they attack the male, the male feminists, they do the same mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. yeah, because they're just weak and not mm -hmm. mature yeah. and whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, it kind of ties again back into this thing about, you know, a, a manly man like at Fox News is someone who's powerful and sexually potent. And women are just so, so, you know, sort of like, you know, faint in lust as they walk by just from the testosterone that's, <laughs> yes. you know, and like wafting behind them. That, that magical blend of testosterone and aqua velva. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> I don't, I mean, and that stuff is fed in the media, but um, the reality and is that, yeah, women, it, it's been interesting to me, especially in the wake of the Trump election in America, that the people who are leading the resistance are women. If you not only look at who organized the march, the Women's March, but also mm -hmm. they did a survey of people who were doing activism online, and the bulk of them were middle-aged women making the phone calls. Yeah. I and think that because makes they, perfect like, sense. They've seen, like worst times and they don't want to go back to those yeah. worst times and it looks dangerously close to getting there so they're like no this needs to stop and yeah. now it's women at fox news it's been women at fox news who brought down you know internally by making the reports or going public uh, to mm. bring attention to it but the supported then by the outside so it's been interesting how women's subversive behavior has been very effective since january <laughs> or in the last year or so yeah, mm. it's been it's been quite um, inspiring to see. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I whenever I see something online like a petition started by women to get this sexist thing stopped or whatever, I'm just like, yeah, we're, we're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Of course, then you have on the other side of the coin, you have people like Theresa May and Marie Le Pen, oh, oh. who almost <laughs> seem to be. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. it's. It's quite entertaining too to see that side of it. So yeah, don't even get me started on Theresa May. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, since we're kind of um, swapping over, because I know there were some other things that we wanted to talk about, uh, but any uh, predictions on whether or not there will be true corporate culture reform at Fox News with the second generation and feistier women who won't take it? Or do you think that the uh, culture there uh, is just so much wrapped up in the conservative ideology, which also feeds into this, that they might not be able to really break out of this and it's going to continue to be a problem for them in future. Uh, I'll go with uh, Rez first and then Jody. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there is, I think that there, okay, I think that due to the fact that women are finally standing up, um, there will be change, but I think it's going to be pushed back against pretty hard, and I think it's going to be a very, very long and slow process. But I don't. I think it's almost inevitable if the women continue to stand up the way that they have been. I mean, at least Jody? maybe that's hopeful thinking. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Jody, now you. Uh, yeah, no, I, I kind of agree. Like, I think seeing like what's happening at the moment more women will start to think hey if i stand up and speak my mind then maybe something better will come of it um so i think in that respect it will get better but again slowly because like res said with anything especially when it comes to women standing up and saying what they want um like with like the younger generation coming in um it's kind of difficult to, to say like either they'll like go along with the times and like try and make a change 
be all because that's good business plan or if like the idea of Rupert Murdoch's like Rupert Murdoch's ideas are so heavily ingrained it they might not be able to escape it I don't know but I think definitely uh women pushing back will start happening more often at least I'm hoping so yeah well um speaking of anyway oh yeah do you want to come back on that and then I was going to segue into the next bit well, I was just going to say, I think that um, the the real change is ultimately going to be, or if this will ever even happen, when these powerful men stop thinking that their power is an automatic aphrodisiac. I think mm -hmm. that their idea is so um, big in their mind that because I'm I'm powerful and I'm famous, that these women are going to throw themselves at me and I can do whatever I want. Until that thinking goes away, it's not going to change. You know what I mean? That's yeah. when people say male entitlement. That's mm -hmm. the kind of attitudes that they're talking about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that's just, I mean, that'll be combated with the more women that come out and say, actually, that's not true. I don't actually really want to, you know. of um, one step forward, two steps back. Jody, maybe you would like to tell the audience a little bit about a recent, some recent events having to do with women's clothing in the workplace in the UK. And once you've kind of summarized it, give your thoughts and impressions on it. And then um, it'll be Rez's turn to, to react. Yeah. Um, well, recently in the UK, I'm not quite sure how recently, up a bit today, so it's quite recent, I suppose. Um, a woman was sent home without pay because she was wearing flat shoes as opposed to uh, heels because her form made it so that they had to wear heels but obviously the men didn't because men don't wear heels um and there was a big like saying that the government needs to change this so that uh employers so that women have to wear heels or low cut tops or short skirts like so basically they're appropriate if that makes any sense um yep and there's like this whole petition trying to get this changed and i heard today that it hasn't been changed and that employers are still going to be able to to wear heels or yeah low cut tops tight fitting clothing as their uniform and they don't really have a say in it um and i just think that's absolutely awful um not only because it's really women have to look sexy well while at work like they're doing their job they're yeah they're there to make a living they're not there to be sex objects um for the most part anyway obviously there are some jobs which that is the case but not real yeah. estate yeah um, or whatever else exactly and also because like wearing heels for like an eight hour shift i can barely wear heels for like an hour without my feet starting to hurt mm -hmm. and the amount of pain that these women must be going through because they have to wear heels like yeah for some people it may be fine but for the majority of women their feet are going to be killing after a few hours and these are women who are probably on their feet a lot of the day like say shop assistants they're on their feet all day walking around maybe um going up little step ladders to get things off high shelves or whatever like not only is it sexist not only does it hurt but it's so impractical as well like it's just it's just ridiculous to me that employees can basically force women to wear these shoes or these tops or skirts uh and get away with it just because like it should be changed because that's how it's always been right exactly <laughs> that's normal res your thoughts 
Well, I feel like this is like a prime example of why, despite my decision to call myself an egalitarian, why um, feminism is still needed and why I'm so grateful that there are people like you guys who dedicate yourself to these issues specifically. Because, I mean, clearly this is not something that affects men. And, um, you know, there have been studies that show how not just that it's uncomfortable because it is un un uncomfortable as crap. Like I won't even wear them. I've never worn high heels, don't know how to walk in them, refuse to walk in them. The idea that I would actually lose out on a job that I want because I don't want to be in pain is astounding to me. But despite, I mean, on top of that, there are studies that show that it's bad for you. That they're, they're, I mean, wearing high heels for long periods of time is actually like skeletally bad for you. So the fact that they would demand that you do something that not only, like you said, is impractical, um, incredibly uncomfortable, but like physically harmful to you is mm. it blows my mind and it makes me mad. I mean, it's, it just makes me mad. <laughs> like, yeah, who, who would even think like what kind of person out there is running not i mean just like okay the fact that the government condones this is disgusting but then who as an individual as a a company owner says uh you know it matters what shoes you're wearing and that you can wear unsafe shoes like you know here in the united states uh we have osha which is about wearing like safe shoes, you know? And then there it's, you gotta look sexy. Like I, it blows my mind. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it is a, a prime example of why feminism is needed. And I am so grateful to women like you that um, make it y'all's purpose. Mm -hmm. I think I think it would be a good idea for the next International Women's Day. If um, you have a, in the UK a campaign, walk a mile in her shoes and have no. men, dead oh, men raise money good. for a charity of their choice and wear high heels all day. Because they That's don't know. Brilliant. I mean, they it just don't. see that it looks good, right? It's heterosexual men. I don't want to mm -hmm. generalize all men, but heterosexual men, uh, and uh, maybe some lesbians too, possibly. Um, <laughs> but they. I will like, admit, a woman looks kind of yes, sexy, yes. but you don't need to go to work. <laughs> no, no, exactly. Thank you. And, yeah, wearing them for any length of time is agony because think about just standing on your toes, this front ball and toes for hours on end, all of your body weight and having to have your center of gravity in such a way that, you know, because you can't really rest back on your heels and high heels if they slide, right. you're gonna, you're mm -hmm. over. So you're walking around on your toes and you, the tops of your foot all day long. It's so painful and the blood circulation stops and your foot aches and they swell. Mm -hmm. And men, I think, and it doesn't just hurt while you're wearing them. Then they hurt yeah. all night too. So it's not. Oh, it's like yeah. it's a whole twenty-four hour pain issue you're talking about. And then you have to do it again the next day. <laughs> and then you have to do it again the next day, right? And I don't care what Doctor Scholl says; they're little pads. They don't help nothing. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think you know it's it's a it's a basic issue. One of like you know bodily control, like you said, if you have a situation where you have to go to work and you have to look pleasing in a heteronormative way so you have to dress in a way that men customers will find attractive because you're not doing it for the women or it's straight women right um yeah so this this norm that women should conform to what men find pleasing even in the workplace they should be physically pleasing to men is the problem itself and then the outgrowth of that attitude is mm -hmm. thinking that it's not a big deal to ask women to um, you know, wear high heels all day, or it's not a big deal to ask a woman to bear her rapist child, you know, and that's right. not a big thing, right? Yeah. It's only nine months. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, it's a, it's a, it changes your body forever, and there are health complications and risks that go along with it. I can attest to that. It changes your body forever. <laughs> you are never and, the same person again. <laughs> and like the psychological impact of it, like I can't even imagine like being forced to carry a baby that maybe you don't want or yeah. like you you just yeah I just can't imagine like what that would do on your psyche like I would imagine you would relive the rape over and over again how can you oh, not yeah or even you know but Margaret Sanger the baby, it would be like their physical reminder forever like mm -hmm. yeah Margaret Sanger, who was is a sort of the founder of Planned Parenthood, and she was a racist. Just going to put that out there. Um, no, she was a racist. But what she talks about in her like pamphlets was meeting with women who, in the industrial age, were incredibly uh, poor, living hand to mouth, and um, you know they were in poverty, dire situations because of the low wages, because this is you know before unions and things. Um, and what she had one story that stuck out in my mind was a, a woman who already had like two or three kids 
and she found out she was pregnant again. She had no idea how she was going to keep her family from starving. So every night um, when the kids would go to bed, she would go into the uh, chair and get the heaviest book in the house and <sighs> slam her belly over oh. and over and over, trying to induce a miscarriage oh, so that she could feed God. the kids she already had. Wow. That's, oh, what I think of. That's what I think of when I think about Planned Parenthood clinics closing down. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And the coat hanger thing. Yeah, the lengths that women will go to to miscarry if they can't have the baby or don't want the baby, like, piece of, like, oh, this is just a random thing that I want to do because I don't want a baby. Ha ha ha. Like, women will, like, be injure themselves if yes. they don't think that they can handle another baby or a baby. Like, throw themselves yeah. down staircases. Yeah. yeah. I was talking to a friend of, of mine about it yesterday and he brought up the point. He was like, you know, look, if you dis, if you outlaw abortions, it's not like the abortions are going to stop. You're still going to be having mm -hmm. abortions. It's just going to be, they're very dangerous. And now a lot of women are going to die while it's happening. Exactly. But the abortions aren't going to go away. I mean, for the most part. And that's, that's true. I mean, if you've decided that you can't have that baby for whatever reason, you will take it upon yourself then if you, if you must, you know, most, I mean, I, a lot of women would anyway. They, I yeah. remember watching a, uh, a film quite a few years ago and in it there was this uh woman who was like i think she was like 15 or something and she'd accidentally got pregnant and there was a scene where she was just sat in the bathroom crying and punching her stomach like oh, that made me like stream with tears because it's just like oh my god this actually happens yeah. Well, and everybody, you know, they, they talk about how they deserve it. They deserve it. But like they're acting as though they've never made a mistake. They've never exactly. made a bad decision. And, yeah. uh, you know, you to, to say that she deserves something like that because she made a bad decision or maybe she didn't. I mean, sometimes people use birth control and they still get pregnant or there's a rape or something mm -hmm. like that. But even if it is a matter of she just decided, you know, let's just do it without a condom or whatever, and it was a honest to goodness mistake, like how many of us have not have done that or mm. something similar to that? You know what I mean? So to judge her so harshly that she deserves that, she deserves that kind of punishment or she deserves to have to carry the baby because of a mistake she made one night, um, it, it just blows my mind because that... It, especially because it comes so much from the religious part right and there and one of the mm -hmm. whole big things there is don't judge lest ye be judged right who <laughs> among us hasn't done that kind of shit exactly. i don't know well it's interesting because you know if you've read numbers which not a lot of people have done because it's boring as shit but there is <laughs> instructions there if a man suspects his wife is, is pregnant because of adultery he can take her to the, you know, the Jewish at the time, the, the priest, and he would, uh, the priest would prepare a potion, and then she would drink it, and if she had a miscarriage, then she was guilty, and if she didn't, then she wasn't guilty. Wow. That's yeah, that's disgusting. Now, that it says is... something like, make her thigh swell, but the translations, if you go underneath, they say, this means miscarry. Um, wow. so, and, and also, the fact that women have always wanted to control, or have, you know, for a long time, mm. since written records, watching a documentary about ancient Rome, and they were talking about, like, the family in ancient Rome. One of the things they mentioned was that the Romans used to re refer to this plant as an abortifacient, and it came from a, a certain kind of a uh, plant that grew on an island that when the Roman Empire expanded, they acquired it and they discovered the plant had the properties of if you took it, it would induce a miscarriage. And it was so popular that it, they actually over farmed it and it went extinct. So we don't have the oh, plant wow. anymore. Uh -huh. uh, you know, um, yeah. So women have always wanted to be able to control the number of the, ki the kids they have because they want the kids they have to survive, you know, and a lot of times it's, it's not about you know, as Jody was saying, it's not a light decision. Most women have uh, abortions for economic reasons. Mm. Yeah, and, and many women. And I think a lot of women have abortions based on what they believe is best for what would be the child. They, yeah, they don't want to bring the child, bring a child into that circumstance, which would be a terrible place. And so before even letting it get to, you know, I I think that a lot of times people are making the decision not even based on what's best for them as much as they are based on what's best for the fetus. Mm. Yeah, basically. Yeah. And like, I, oh, sorry. No, Carry just on. like you know, people that I've, women that I've known in that situation, uh, no one's ever taken it lightly. It's always, mm -hmm. it was if the person later wanted to have kids, it was, 
I wanted kids, but this was not, this wasn't the family I wanted to raise them in. Yeah. You know, like, um, this was, I was just a situation in this particular person, it was a situation she was getting out of. And it was just not, it was not a life that she wanted to bring a child into. And later on, she got into another relationship and she's had kids now and she's really happy. Yeah. Um, and those mm -hmm. kids have two parents and a stable house. And that's what she wanted. That was yeah. what she wanted to do for children. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think um, with Planned Parent specifically, at least with my experience with Planned Parenthood and why I think it's such an important thing is um, they don't let you take it lightly. You have, I mean, at least in my experience, I had to go through a counseling uh, session before to, to ensure that I really understood what I was doing and that I had options and to make sure that I, I was right or that I felt right about what I was doing. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of, uh, I, I, I don't know for sure, but I, I, I would imagine that a lot of abortion clinics or abortion places that are more about like um, profit-based wouldn't do that. Um, Planned mm -hmm. Parenthood isn't about profit-based though. And so they really, I think, care genuinely about you and won't let you take it lightly. Oh, I love me some Planned Parenthood. <laughs> <laughs> Planned Parenthood for everyone. Well, if, Jody, do you want to talk a little bit, since we're on the topic, on how the NHS, because I think Rez might be quite shocked, the NHS's approach to contraception and uh, when you can get it? Yeah. Um, well, contraception, you can, I don't know what the cutoff age is. Um, I think it might be 25, but from like the age of 15 to 25 or something, you can go into and get free condoms um i don't know if you have to have a card or something i've never done it but i know people who have you can just walk in to certain places and be like and they will give you like a handful of condoms just for that's free awesome. that's awesome yeah a um, lot of um gay and lesbian uh organizations do that too here where you can just walk in and get condoms yeah, um, I know that at Pride last year, um, I went and there were like loads of stools with like loads of obviously stuff for gay and lesbian people. And they would just give out like goodie bags with like a hundred condoms in and like mm -hmm. loads of lube and like <laughs> information. <laughs> it, was and stuff. it was brilliant. I got a massive haul there. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, <laughs> I think yeah. loads of lube needs to be something that needs to oh, be like the name definitely. of a band or something. <laughs> um, but yeah. Anyway, with uh, other forms of contraception um, to just walk in, well, make a doctor's appointment and be like, I want some form of contraception. They'll like talk it through with you, see what's best for you, like uh, long term stuff or like hormone stuff or like, basically what would be best for you that's awesome then like the same day sometimes if it's the pill or like a week or two later if it's something for an implant or something you just go in you get whatever you're you've decided on getting and that's it it's that's awesome. it's entirely I free think with the pill um if you don't have free prescriptions, because not everyone does, I think you have to pay £10 per prescription, but I'm not entirely sure because I've always been on free prescriptions. But that's um, not per month, that's for like three months at a time, right? Yeah, yeah, I think that's like three months worth, um, but I haven't been on the pill since I was like 16 or 17, so I can't quite remember the exact uh, thing. But yeah, no, basically Such a smart it's way to do it. free or very, very cheap to have contraception. But again, if the contraception fails. Right. Um, and it does sometimes. Like, not, no contraception yeah. is 100%. Yeah, like I've had a couple of like scares like, oh, God, the condom split. So I literally went into a chemist the next day, said the morning after pill. They took me into a back room, asked me a couple of questions like, oh, uh, were you using unprotected sex, blah, blah, blah. And then they 
gave me the Dawning After Pill for free. Wow. Um, but I think that is only free up until you're 18 or 20, and then you have to pay like five pounds for the pill or something like that. Um, don't quote me on the numbers because I've never had to pay for it. Um, but yeah, so it's pretty easy. Although, again, I haven't had to use that service in like at least three years, four years. So I don't know if it's the same now with the morning after pill. Um, but at least a few years ago, I literally just went into the back room of the chemist and they had to watch me take the pill because you could have taken it out and given it to someone else. Um, oh, interesting. But they need to, yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's a pretty. See, step. that's amazing. And, and, and it, it goes to show like, I mean, a lot of the people, at least here in the United States, uh, a lot of people that are against abortion are also against like sex education and stuff. Yeah, that's um, absolutely ridiculous. It <laughs> is, right? <laughs> If you want to prevent unwanted pregnancies, let's talk about contraception. <laughs> mm. Or no, let's not talk about it and just assume that people are going to be abstinent. Because, yeah, that has <laughs> ever worked before. Oh, totally. <laughs> uh, the thing I don't get about that is, you know, the best time to make sure people have uh, certain basic understandings is when they're at school. And I believe in age-appropriate sex education. Sure. I think I received age-appropriate sex education because I can still tell you today that syphilis is a bloodborne disease and so you have to do a blood draw to test for it, just like HIV. Um, I learned that in health class when I was like, I don't know, 15 or something. And it's too late. If you say at 15, 16, 17, 18, um, or let's say 17 because some people graduate and they turn 18 afterwards, that they're kids and they're too young to learn about these things, you're never going to have mm. another chance to teach people this. They're never, mm. There's no guarantee anyone's ever going to sit in a classroom again. And it's not. I lost my virginity at 13 years old. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And that is not a completely abnormal thing here in this country. Yeah. So right. I feel like we need to be starting to talk about, talk about it at like 12, in my opinion. Mm. Well, by the time your body's changing, you should be understanding exactly what the chemicals that are happening and what you can expect and um, how boys and girls are, you know, become men and women. The, you know, the basics of, of sex and also ideas of consent. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that's Sorry. about health. I think, you know, schools are a great time to talk about the issues of consent and especially at that age too, when you get to 15 and sometimes even younger, but, you know, I think people would flip out if it was younger than 15. If you talk about drinking and consent mm. and sex, because I know people will flip out and say, oh, you're saying that if my girlfriend and I get drunk, we can't have sex. Or if two people are drunk and they have sex, they've raped each other. There's, there are legal boundaries about intoxication and ability to consent. And I use the example in another hangout about the fact that if you sign a contract, if you sell someone your house and they got you drunk and talk, you know, they got you drunk and you <laughs> signed that while you were intoxicated, that's not a legally binding contract because in a mm -hmm. sober state, you that's might have made point. a different decision. And that's why I say, if you, if you're worried about them getting behind the wheel, wait for them to sober up and then have sex with them because don't yeah. you want to have sex with someone who wants to have sex with you i mean that's, that's true. Kind of like Somebody's yeah. not going to regret it yeah yeah and for men too i think that they need to basically not have sex with a woman if they think she's too drunk to protect themselves women are asked to protect ourselves all the time by not walking down certain streets by ourselves mm -hmm. and to have our keys out and don't dress a certain way and don't go you know don't go to certain places and don't get drunk and we've never mm -hmm. asked men to not do something to protect themselves from that kind of, you know, thing. And so, yeah, just wait for her to sober up a bit and make sure that she understands what's going on. Again, if you wouldn't trust her like, behind the wheel, just wait. I agree. Yeah, that's a, it's like mm. a perfect thing. If you wouldn't trust her behind the wheel, then you can't assume that she's consenting. Exactly. And like, she's going to write enough brain to consent. If, if you imagine the woman you want to have sex with, if you think that say you have a mother or a daughter or a sister or something if they were in that state and someone tried to have sex with them upset would you be outraged at the fact that someone tried to have sex with your mum or your sister when they were this drunk a lot of the time people are like oh it doesn't affect me because it's not a personal issue but if you try and imagine it as a as a very personal issue like holy shit like yeah 
person because they are this drunk like you may not it might not twig until you think oh okay that could be my sister she was that yeah. drunk then yeah yeah that makes perfect sense and i think a lot of people don't eat, don't think about it that way so it's it's good to get mm-hmm. them to think about it that way yeah i yeah. think some people have a real problem with empathy and that's why i go for the rational choice of look the cost of being accused of sexual mm-hmm. assault because she doesn't you know she was um really drunk and she had blacked out for parts of that night and she doesn't you know she, she had sex and she doesn't remember consenting now you've got problems whereas mm. if you just like let it go send her home with her friends in a taxi and call her the next day all of the problems would have been avoided so just yeah. look out it's for a very yourself. pragmatic way to, to approach it keep it in like, your pants and you'll be safe you know like you're right i do think that there's a serious empathy problem so it probably does make more sense to explain how it will affect you mm-hmm. or the man than how yeah. it would affect the woman like do you want to have one night of very subpar <laughs> sex or do you want to possibly spend however many years in prison yeah. right what do you really want here? Like, you may be horny, but you can go home and wank. Like, yes, exactly. <laughs> there are ways to handle that situation that don't involve. <laughs> yeah, you're only ever five minutes away from an orgasm if you really need one. You know? <laughs> <laughs> There's no need to involve anyone else. Oh, there's another something that needs to be a title of something, a book or something. You're only ever five minutes away from it. I love it. Oh, there must be a book called that. It's Loads of lube, and picture. you're only ever five minutes away. Yeah. <laughs>
you know, who might say more words in a, a casual setting. But in business settings and other professional settings, it tends to be men who out talk women. So there's one thing about, so there's, there's a lot of gendered things going on here. And when I say gendered, I might want to unpack that a little bit more so that I'm clear what I'm thinking of. What I'm talking about are, are practices that one sex does more than another. And also there's the social norms about when it's appropriate for men and women to speak. So there's here, I, I, I would agree that men tend to just interrupt everybody more, you know, and, and you'll see that it's, uh, if you've ever watched all well, the old school crosstalk or any other kind of politics shows when there's, you know, four men on a panel, you know, they'll jump in and, and over each other and women in our speech patterns and this might be social conditioning but we do tend to if someone interrupts us we'll yield the floor let them speak and then try to re-enter re-enter the conversation or maybe just not ever speak up again and the problem really happens when and i'm not just talking about like an individual who does it consciously but when you have a power situation where men are are normalized to talk more than women and then you have their habit of interrupting people women basically face two barriers there one is to just be heard, and then when they're actually speaking, to not be interrupted. So the phenomenon is, you know, it's, it is a consequence of, you know, a lot of social factors. It does give men more floor time and more airtime and credibility at the expense of women. Mm -hmm. And so the issue is, you know, how do we deal with it without even making it personal? How do we start to reflect on the way that the speech patterns are running in our own meetings? And when somebody interrupts a female colleague, if she doesn't continue to just try to talk over him, to say, I'm sorry, I was listening to what Beth was saying, can she finish her thought? Mm -hmm. Doing things that, and that's part of the reason why uh, I created the format in Feminist Talk Back the way I did, which is more of a turn, I've been pretty loose here, if you've noticed, <laughs> um, the turn taking, because we're pretty good. We're naturally good turn takers, we women, in this con in this particular hangout. But, and I love them to death, uh, Tim, is and he's not the only one but you know tim and kevin and and michael you get those three in a hangout and sometimes <laughs> you'll hear four voices out of three guys you know um so <laughs> <laughs> they they have you know tim especially and he's never malicious about it he's never the person who's doing it he someone will say something and he'll have an idea in his head and he'll have a quip and in a live conversation or in a group conversation when you're in person in the pub he can make that quip and people it's not as distracting but in a purely audio format uh, people will sometimes stop and then he'll just kind of keep going. <laughs> so yeah. he'll, he'll pop but see, up. He's an example of the kind of man who's not doing it because right. he thinks his, that his idea is more valid than a woman's. Right. So when I wanted to do this show, he was one of my first guests and I thought, okay, I, I need to figure out a way to structure this because I don't want it to be like that in the show as much. So I came up with the turn taking, the idea that we each take our turn. Um, and I created a situation and it wasn't about me shaming Tim. It wasn't me going at the start of every hangout, Tim, make sure you don't interrupt everybody or calling him out on it every time, yeah. right? I structures I structured these hangouts in such a way that it's very difficult for people to interrupt because you know you're going to get your turn. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. So that's my response. It's not a clear answer of yes or no. I mean, I think there are people who are sexist who are jerks. Um, and if you have people like that in your workplace, then having a discussion with the people who run the meetings about the dynamics in the room um, might be, you know, I think it's important to point it out. Mm -hmm. And it is gendered and that men do it more than women. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't definitely. think it's necessary to broad brush every man who interrupts as being as having malicious intent. As I know, mm -hmm. Tim does not. He's usually really funny. What comes out of his mouth is hilarious and it distracts us and that's why he gets to steal <laughs> the show. You know? um, so it's it's really not about pointing fingers so much as pointing to a situation. I see. Mm -hmm. I see. I, I I think I think I see it more as a maybe this is again me not really knowing the ins and outs of like this whole social this particular part of the social justice thing, but I see it more as as just a respect issue than necessarily a feminist issue. Yeah, I reckon that you're right in that respect because men who don't realize that they're doing it, and I have a few times been like sorry I haven't finished and they'd be like oh sorry like they didn't actually realize that what they were doing was wrong mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um but obviously there are some guys who I'm better than them so I deserve to speak 
more than them or oh that's just a woman speaking so it doesn't matter like there are obviously (laughs) going to be men like that but that's not the majority of them I don't think and yeah the workplace that that's happened to because I've only ever had one volunteer job um and I had all females at the job which was pretty awesome um (laughs) Yeah, I've never um, noticed that. But in like job interviews, because I I applied for a job last year and it was a group interview and it was a really fun interview, actually. But I did see that like in the interview were speaking a lot more than the women. And I made like a mental note of that and like consciously made sure that I spoke up more and made sure that I could be heard more. Um, That's awesome. I wanted the job. Um, I didn't get the job, unfortunately, but I wanted the job and I didn't want me uh, wanting to make sure that everyone else was okay with speaking affect my my outcome. Like, I didn't want to be the meek person in the corner just letting everyone else speak. So, yeah, I did make a conscious effort of speaking up more and maybe I might have even done the interrupting thing. Like, I'm not quite sure. I can't quite remember. But I do remember thinking, these guys are talking a lot. I need to get my points in or else I don't have a chance at this job. Yeah. 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 I think it's a feminist issue in that if you have a a dynamic change in a workplace where previously the guys around the table were able to interrupt sort of freely into a more moderated situation, then women's voices are going to be more likely to be heard and therefore taken seriously and therefore advance their careers. So because it disproportionately affects women, it's a feminist issue um, and in that definitional way, kind of way. But I think also, you know, there's some um, good things that can come out of a more moderated discussion that would benefit men too. And you know, to, to say, you know, this isn't also just like a conservative right, right wing thing. I heard a story about early on in the Obama administration, he had quite a, a diverse group of people on his staff and he would have staff briefings and they would discuss issues. And what women in the group noticed was that one of them would say something um, and then the conversation would kind of move on and then a man would say something very similar or the same thing and the president would notice it. And so what the women started doing was when one of their colleagues made a good point, when it was her turn to talk, you know, she would say, oh, I, you know, I just want to back up what's, what Sarah was saying or, you know, what, what Linda was saying. I think that was a really good idea. And women yeah. started to basically do that for the other women in the room until the president noticed. <laughs> that's, that's really good. That's really Interesting. Good. And this is o- uh, Obama? Yeah who I don't believe to be a sexist at all. Exactly. And they're really, Mm -hmm. you know, very interesting subconscious um, things, you know, that uh, we've been conditioned to just think are normal or to have certain ways of paying attention. And, and yeah, rather than Mm -hmm. like confront him or get all angry, you know, they just came up with the strategy of, of a sisterhood and like supporting each other in those meetings. That's brilliant. That's what we need to do to support each other. Do you think this might be weird, but um, okay. When you're training a dog, Okay, this is, please just run with me for a second. (laughs) When you're training a dog, you are told to speak in a deeper voice, that a deeper voice is considered more authoritative. Do you think that that could play into this a little bit? Oh, yeah. Their their voices are just deeper and so thought Mm. to have more authority by virtue of just that? Yeah, there are studies that show that women politicians who have deeper voices do better, um, you know, or are seen more positively than women with wow. higher voices. And so, yeah, we do have just on a very basic kind of unconscious level, certain reactions um, based on impressions, physical impressions, and also, you know, in this case, the tone of voice. Yeah, mm-hmm. interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. And, like, and how do you overcome that? <laughs> because you know, dogs mm-hmm. clearly aren't sexist, right? I mean, that's <laughs> oh, no, no, no. It's a natural so- reaction to. So, how do you even overcome something like that? Well, first step is awareness of it. Yeah, um, because there are people. Like, there are YouTube channels that um, you know. I well, I don't sub to a lot of people whose like voices I find annoying, but I have watched videos, and it's okay. Like if I find a woman's voice annoying, I will. Go, okay, you know what? That's just her voice. 
you know, mm -hmm. realize yeah. it because it's not just men who are affected by that. Yeah, you know, women are too. Mm -hmm. So well, I will go, say that I don't want to say his name because I, well, yeah, I'll say it. Um, that undoomed guy. There's yeah, something yeah. about his voice. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I cannot watch him. I like I watch a lot of people on the right, and now I've even started watching like anti people just to kind of see what's going on. I can't watch him because his voice just drives me up a wall. So I mean, there is just almost like a, an innate reaction we have to different sounds that don't even make any sense. Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah, I should so watch him though, like for what you said, and just go, "That's just his voice." <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess, you know, there's nothing, you know, if you find someone's voice is irritating, that's, you know, that's, that's the, just how it's going to be. But I think Rachel Maddow was in the documentary Misrepresentation, or maybe it was something else. She said that since mm -hmm. she started out in radio and then television, about 10% of the stuff she gets is just hate. Like telling her out, you know, she's ugly and she's this and the other. And she just said, you know, my face is my face. There's nothing I can do mm -hmm. about it. But if you can get over it and get past it to hear what I'm saying, it's not going to get any worse. And there's also a teaching in Buddhism that you shouldn't let the characteristics of the teacher get in the way of the teachings. So if someone mm. has a, a, a whistle um, when they speak or they speak with a strange accent, if you focus on that, you stop listening to what they're actually trying to tell you. So yeah, very interesting. in in high school, I had I was I absolutely loved history and I chose it for my uh, GCSEs, which I don't know if you know about them, but they're like the uh, exams at the end of school. Um, and I loved it. And then I had this teacher whose voice just was monotonous. And mm -hmm. I managed to look past it for a few, for like a couple of the topics that we did because the topics were just so interesting. But then one of the topics, which was sport, leisure and tourism through history, that combined with his voice, it, it dropped my grade down by two mark, uh, two grades because I just couldn't, I just couldn't get past it and I just couldn't take it in and I just like zoned out and like I just did awful on the exams for it because I didn't learn anything or much about it because with what I found was a boring topic yeah. it was just ridiculous and yeah I, I wish that I had been able to get past that, that monotonous voice because I would have loved to have got the A that I was predicted um but, yeah that's really yeah, interesting no, it's just unfortunate that some voices they can just be so bad like for me personally it's the monotone monotonous voices that really like I just zone straight out um I've only found that in men um but I'm sure <laughs> there are some women out there who have the boring monotonous one tone voice um but yeah, yeah so it's just annoying that there are some voices that you just can't get past which yeah. I'm sure what they're talking about is valuable and interesting and whatever but yeah <laughs> <laughs> so as long as we're kind of off topic we'll just go there I'll go with a little personal story too so one of my favorite shows is my kitchen rules from Australia and there is one particular region it seems like every season they have at least one usually it's it's women from this area and they have that what I find terribly annoying habit <laughs> of always raising the end of every statement or clause. Oh, like yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they're doing it with these Australian accents. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they end up sounding like, oh yeah, it's gonna be good, yeah? Or and it's like chickens. Like, oh, I'm going to take this asparagus and I'm going to do this, right? <laughs> and one set of ladies ended up actually making it like almost oh, to the grand finals. And I had a, a period of like three or four episodes where I'm like, I can't do it. I can't do Jack and Chaz anymore. They're just, their accents are doing me in. They're doing me in. Wow. But, uh, yeah, so that's the one that does it for me. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be Australian though. Anyone who asks things in a question when it's actually statements. Yeah, mm. I agree. That is bad. That's very bad. That is annoying. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> What's up, everybody? 
thing is done. I just about this is the last touch. All right, we're way off topic now. So, um, yeah, any more on the man interrupting? I think is the phenomenon is called. Not for me. I, I, I feel I, I understand now more why it would be considered a feminist issue for sure. I think oh, it, I think opinion. it isn't a purely feminist issue, but I, I can see why it would be something that would should be like a, um, addressed by feminism. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I think, for instance, you know, like a domestic abuse, it started as a feminist issue. And then because women were talking about it, men felt open to say, hey, that happens to me, too. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why, even though it, it can, when you say it's a feminist issue, it doesn't mean, to me, that doesn't mean it belongs to women. It means it disproportionately affects women. And it's women who give it voice, and that opens up the space for everybody else. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I'm going to keep that one in my back pocket, it, the, the, uh -huh. the dis disproportionate thing. <laughs> yeah. Do, do, do. Okay. So now into the fancy schmancy technology part of the show. We're going to talk about one article because we've been going for about an hour and a half already. Um, <laughs> and the article that we're going to feature this week is reported out here by uh, latest.com. It's Mormon mommy blogger urges followers to join the white baby challenge to combat black ghetto culture. Oh, uh, it makes me so mad. <laughs> so just a little wow. bit from the article. A crazy Mormon mommy blogger is now urging her followers to take part in the White Baby Challenge in order to combat, oh, they're right, they basically repeated the same line, sorry. Alt-right blogger Alia, a mother of six, claimed on her blog Nordic Sunrise that Mormonism is doomed unless white people rise up and breed more. You Mormonism see... is doomed? <laughs> yeah. Okay, sorry, I should, I'm sorry, I'm, I interrupted. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, you guys can see my screen, right? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Yeah. She called on her supporters to take part in the White Baby Challenge, which challenges white families to have more children. I've made six. Match me or beat me, she wrote. She went on to say that white people can't restore our civilization with somebody else's babies. Oh, my God. Um, I'm not even going to read her quote. Um, and, and then she gets into some racist stuff, attacking uh, blah, blah, blah. So... This is a, here's a few other weird things that she's shared. The white race matters. Wow. And, um, that's her not having any white guilt. So, I'm right now. <laughs> <laughs> so who wants to uh, take that one up first? Rez? I, sure. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm so, it, the first thing that struck me as you were, it struck me as you were, um, doing that is you know that one of the things it's so it, again pointing out the hypocrite on both sides right S one of the things that the right people do that they bitch about is that we make everything either a feminist issue or whatever and they make jokes about that but i mean look at how she is turning racism into a mormon thing <laughs> really black people are, are 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 somehow threatening your religion are you kidding me uh it just uh, she blows my mind and she's the kind of person that i just um I can I can I can understand a little bit the desire to slap somebody when I see her. <laughs> I get it. Like first of all, <laughs> um, the fact that she has six kids scares the shit out of me because yeah. she's going to be raising them six kids with that oh, belief yeah. and letting them loose in the world. Like we need more of those people out there. <laughs> but yep. more importantly, like I do not understand this concept that if you guys are so afraid of white genocide, if you're so afraid that you know, the black people or the Muslim people or the whatever people are going to, you know, eradicate the white people, um, then maybe you should uh, understand that maybe that's, if that's going to happen, then maybe that's for the best. I'm not saying that's for the best. I don't think that's going to happen. But the fact that you feel like you need to somehow take actions to preserve your race um, and you're actually going to enact um, laws or an ethno state or whatever it is that you're wanting to preserve your race, um, then maybe your race isn't that fucking great, right? I, maybe that's a weird way to look at it. But I just think if you really think that you need to try and enact some law so that your grandkid doesn't have sex with a black person because you're afraid of white genocide, then uh, something is wrong with your thinking. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. No, 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 no. You do know. <laughs> and you're right. <laughs> yeah, and I am not saying that I have white guilt. I am proud that I'm a white person. I am proud. You know, I like, I'm not proud, but you know, I'm like not ashamed of it. 
I, this has nothing to do with white guilt. Um, it's just, I, I don't understand why, if you are that convinced that you are superior, then why are you so afraid that something's going to come along and take y'all down? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this whole appeal to, you know, basically women to breed. I, I, when I posted this on Facebook, I, my quote was, I'm trying to think of a worse reason to bring a child in the world. Uh, I got nothing. Yeah. I got nothing. Good point. This is like, yes, go out and, and basically match or beat the fact that I've had six kids. And just for the fact of how much, you know, melanin they have in their skin tone. Is it mel yeah, it's melanin, not melatonin. Yeah. That's the one that yeah. makes you sleep. Yeah. I didn't do medical science, clearly. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> not an MD, I'm a PhD. Um, but yeah, just that sort of like somehow that's supposed to, I find that especially um, really, to me, it's a symptom of her buying into a, a really patriarchal view of what women are worth. And that's wow. what's between their legs. You know, it's not like be a good mom. It's, you know. But the only thing you're good for is to produce warriors in this fight that we have. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm going to say, uh, I was rather impressed when I learned that in ancient Sparta, if a man died in combat, he was when he was buried, his name was like carved oh. onto a rock. And if a woman died in childbirth, she received the same honor because mm -hmm. both died for Sparta. Mm -hmm. That is and, awesome. Yeah. You know, so and so at least there the the contribution and the risk was acknowledged by the community because women were way more likely to die back then. But now we don't have at least you know most places. Thankfully, we need to reduce infant and maternal mor mortality in around the world. Women are less likely to die, and but we're still mm. seen as those breeding machines. Mm. Interesting. And that is comes right out of religious you know frameworks and things that people who say they're atheists say that they reject. And yet they take all of the value systems right out of that ancient bronze book and say, oh, yeah, this is how we should organize our society. Well, well wait a minute. Why? It's yeah, ridiculous. It's a 20th century. Absolutely ridiculous. And I see, I didn't even think of it that way. When I, my, my only thinking when I was reading it was the racist part of it. But this is why we need people like you pointing out the, the sexism part of it, too. Because I didn't even notice that. Yeah, see, well, there you go. The counter, there we go. A case study. We still need feminism in the West. If nothing else, we like critique our own societies. And... Yes. So, Jody, your thoughts on the, on the article? Uh, yeah. Well, first of all, white genocide is not a thing at all. Mm -hmm. Like, right. until white women are systematically bred with black people uh, for generations, um purely to create babies that aren't white until that happens on a large scale yeah. white genocide is not a thing um like people just getting into relationships with people of a different race to you is not white genocide that's either love or for some people or whatever like it's not a fucking genocide. Like, yeah. And it's quite re disrespectful to call it that, in my opinion. Yeah. Oh, to definitely. people who are actually like, experiencing genocide. Exactly. Like, saying, oh, there aren't as many white people in the world anymore, so that's a genocide, as opposed to there are people who either have or are still being slaughtered by the hundreds of thousands race right. or religion or whatever like not comparable in the slightest um and saying oh we need more white people like no we don't looking back through history white people have been the problem throughout the whole <laughs> we do not need more white people like well, the other thing, too, is if you look at why white women are having fewer kids, it's because this is what happens when incomes go up, education rates mm. go up, and people have access to contraception. So exactly. the answer isn't to add to the burden of overpopulation. Our planet's already creaking under mm. the demands we're placing on it. It's to elevate the economic status and access to contraception um, and other family, family planning services to women around the world. Mm. You know, because yeah, I would 
I was going to say about the overpopulation, like saying, oh, I've had six ch white children um, because we need to repopulate the earth with white people. Like the overpopulation in the world is ridiculous. Like point probably within the next like few generations where our world physically cannot handle so many people so saying let's have six babies each so that white people can live on like that's so a sighted because yeah you may increase the white population in the short term but then long term is going to cause so many more problems than racism or sexism or anything like that like economically speaking and just like speaking it's going to be such a big problem and the fact that like so many people are choosing to only have like um one or two kids or even no kids like that's in my opinion a good thing because they can have as many kids as they want don't get me wrong they can have as many kids as they want as long as they can support them well enough and the reason that they're having them is of a bad reason mm -hmm. i'm not saying this right um, yeah, I but see like, what you're good motivations you want people yeah, to not just the having baby. them because they want more babies to populate the planet or to combat white genocide or something like that like if you want a large family then that's your prerogative but the fact that so many people are choosing to have smaller families i think it's actually quite good and it also speaks testament to how far we've come as a society to accept that because we're only just starting to really accept that some women don't want to have kids which is brilliant because yeah not everyone does want to have a kid um even though some people think that we're made to have the babies and that's all we're good for like it's not um we're our own people and we can decide whether to have kids or not and i think i've gone off on a massive tangent to where my oh, no, first I... point was but <laughs> i'm i just rambled so carry on you two no but i totally agree <laughs> i still well, get I crap because i only had one kid i get crap all the time how could you only have one kid that's such a terrible thing but that's all i wanted jesus <laughs> just only wanted the one god <laughs> Yeah. yeah, well, I've I've never had kids, and I have very distinct memories growing up where my mom would turn to me with a very serious look on her face and say, Christy, you don't have to have kids if you don't want. Mm -hmm. And I later asked her, like, Mom, why would, you know, thank you. I, I appreciate that because <laughs> I know I've heard about, you know, you see in movies the parents who are pushing their kids to have kids and that kind of social pressure. Mm -hmm. But I said, why did you tell me that? And she said, because nobody told me. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, that is, and that's really good. Yeah, and she wanted two kids. She wanted a boy and girl, so she got what she wanted. You know, <laughs> like then she was done. <laughs> um, and then you know, she was done, done for you know. But um, yeah, and so I've never felt a, a really burning maternal instinct. And I always thought if I had the right situation and I got married and it was long term, it was all going to work out. Then I would. And he really wanted to have kids. Then I would think about mm. it. <laughs> <laughs> like, like if yeah. you're in this with me, like I'm not doing this by myself. Oh um, yeah, no doubt. <laughs> uh, and those factors just never came together. And you know what? It doesn't. I'm happy. I mean, I've got. To, I really do enjoy my life, and I'm really happy for my friends who've had kids because they wanted those kids, and those kids are growing up loved. And that's how every child should ideally, you know, that should be their home life. But oh. I also think, I honestly, um, you know, I think about my nephews. I get concerned when when I see my friends' kids, you know, I can't imagine having my own kids and looking at something like climate change. And just in my lifetime from the 1970s until now, I can see how much the the nature's patterns and the and the weather patterns have changed from when I grew up. And in Wisconsin, there's a very famous book, um, The Sand Hill Crane Diaries or something. It's written by an environmentalist. It's a guy who he lived in sort of a southern eastern part of Wisconsin and he basically kept an almanac, the Sand County Almanac. That's what it's called. Hmm. And for in the 1800s, late 1800s, and he wrote like when the birds would appear and when the snow would fall and when this plant would show up. And it was all really stable, like for decades and decades and decades uh, while he was, well, you know, the decades he was doing it. And so that's their benchmark to measure 
a lot of people use that to say how much change is there now compared to so when are the birds arriving now when are the plants showing up now because we have this baseline from before the impact really started to hit i'm terrified for what is, life is going to be like in 75 years food shortages oh, um you. <laughs> you know massive uh, environmental um, climate or weather events that wipe out major places and flood rising waters and having to you know, pour money into dams or you know well, what are we going to do put a put a wall all the way around the east coast of the united states around <laughs> you know it's one thing for the netherlands <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's going to be the wall around Florida. yeah because it's one thing to you know dam up part of the netherlands but the entire eastern and west coasts and stuff so yeah i, I think to me people i mean i it's i hope for the best but i fear what the worst could be mm -hmm. it's a legitimate like, fear mm -hmm. like uh last weekend or the weekend before me my mum and my sister went to a uh national trust place which is like a big garden and we were walking around and we were noticing that flowers which are usually out in may were out like mid april early april and we we're just thinking like this isn't right like that plant isn't usually out for another like something like we are seeing wow. even in my lifetime like i'm only 22 but even in my lifetime i am seeing the effects of climate change and like every year um forecast snow um where i am which is the southwest and we haven't had snow in oh, in I don't know how many years. Like the last time I remember having like loads of snow was when I was sixteen, maybe. Um, and it's crazy considering how far north y'all are. Like there are some places like in uh, north of Wales and in Scotland that like pretty much always get snow every year um but they're like mountainous and like a lot farther up the country than me um but every, but like this year i was excited when i saw a couple of like literally like a minute one minute of a little light fluttering of snow this um, uh, this uh winter and i was like oh my god it's snowing but the ground's too damp from rains for it to settle oh and it stopped well, yeah, that's the um, snow for this winter. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, like, even in my lifetime, it's just, like, noticeable. Yeah, but, and so, yeah, if I brought a child into that, I'd be like, oh, my God, what's it going to be like for them? Yeah, when they're 50 or 60. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there Scary. was a weather um, I, There was a weather report I saw, I think it was last week, where they said, or a week before, that um, we've had now the, the hottest March on record. But we've had 48 consecutive hottest marches on record now. Oh, wow. It's the same here. Mm -hmm. It's the same here. Um, I don't know if we've had the hottest day this year so far, but like the past like five, six, seven years, I remember um, thinking they always say, oh, it's the hottest, uh, uh, hottest day in how many years? And it's just like, but didn't we say that last year? Like, oh, but we said that yeah. the year before like it's just getting hotter and hotter and hotter and the and years like, are getting shorter and shorter oh it's the hottest year since 2012 <laughs> not night not 1972. exactly yeah. <laughs> wow it's scary, scary. <laughs> yeah we need more white warriors than that oh yeah that was a topic <laughs> that's gonna help <laughs> yeah i forgot that was the topic <laughs> 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 white baby warriors <laughs> yeah that's what, that's what the world needs what the world needs now is white baby warriors <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's yeah. awesome <laughs> uh, that needs to be a hit well, song <laughs> <laughs> well i think on that bombshell um we might wrap up the the live show although if you guys stay around we can chat a little bit off air okay. uh, so yeah i'll give you each a chance to say goodbye to the audience first jody uh yeah uh bye it's been nice talking uh, on here again um uh very fun i loved it and uh i'm jody Sinead on youtube and 
on Twitter and Instagram. I'm Jodie Sinead Anywhere, basically. Um, please check me out because I'm still a very small channel and I I would like more people to watch me, please. Thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank you. Um, I will stop the self-promo now and <laughs> hand it over to Rez because... I'm just getting cringy now. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, this was awesome. This was kind of my first like Google Hangout like this. So I just want to thank Christy so much for inviting me. That's just, uh, it makes me feel very good that you would even want me on here. <laughs> and, um, it was such a great conversation. I definitely uh, feel like I had, I, I learned some things that I probably needed to learn. So for that, I thank you as well. Well, it was a really fun conversation and we all kind of gave our different perspectives and that's the point of feminists and others talk back. <laughs> so guys, until next time, I've been Christy. You have been awesome. Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end of the Hangout and I'll be talking to you again very soon. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>